This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. You can fight traffic, fight weight loss, fight in court. All sound more manageable than fighting fire. We go inside outdoors with the Kentucky Division of Forestry Fire Chief for a look at wildfire, brush fires, arson, and a new method of catching the bad guys. Check the calendar. It is fall fire hazard season, and you can have a part to play. It's a show that should spark your interest. And it's next on Kentucky Afield Radio. Hip's a hip word. Hip hop music. This cat is really hip, says 70s star Sammy Davis Jr. But for migratory bird hunters, hip is the law. HIP stands for Harvest Information Program. To hunt birds like doves or geese, you must complete the HIP survey first to help officials better estimate game bird populations. Go to the My Profile page at the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website. You just need five minutes. HIP HIP hooray. FW.KY.gov. Hi, I'm Sadie. When I was born in 94, so was an idea. Kentucky Nature License Plates. Over the years, they've featured butterflies, hummingbirds, and two words, nature's finest. These plates have helped safeguard more than 80,000 acres of wilderness areas, a number that's grown as I have, and I can't wait to see what's down the road. See with me. Next time you renew, choose a nature plate and pick the plate that keeps the bluegrass green. Welcome to Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. When I grow up... I want to be a fireman. How many kids have said that? Little boy who lived next to me as he was growing up did just that. Firefighters are our heroes. Wildfires are the topic today. Forest fires and wildfires in Kentucky aren't as ferocious as they are in the West. And my guest today knows both very well. He is Floyd Willis, the fire chief with the Kentucky Division of Forestry. And Chief Willis, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. I was looking on your homepage with the Division of Forestry, and right there was a picture of a wildfire. The trees weren't burning. It was the stuff on the ground, the leaves and the twigs and the sticks. Is it different in Kentucky than, say, it would be in Arizona? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, here in Kentucky, we have uh, what we call ground fires or surface fires most of the time. I just I actually just got back from a fire assignment in Alaska just on Friday, and yeah. out there they have uh, they'll have the ground fires, but then it reaches up into the crowns. Yeah, oh, and they'll yeah. make runs. Up. So the whole tree is on fire. Yeah, out there, uh, to be honest, uh, there's trees that will only uh, germinate with fire it's it's a fire environment and uh so they actually ever so often uh naturally they'll, they'll have a lightning strike and it will cause the fire and then it gets up into the canopy and it can make a long run like uh there where we were in alaska that that fire can make a six mile run in one day no, you know, like that's that's really moving uh so it's it's been a part of the natural environment out west for you know a long long time Back in 2004, my wife and I went to Alaska. Oh, boy, we were ready. We had the cameras ready to go. Nothing but wildfires. Nothing but forest fires. We couldn't see hardly anything. All we could see was smoke. We went to Fairbanks. They were Everybody there on the street was wearing a mask. It's hard to breathe. I just experienced the same thing. Uh, we flew into Fairbanks, and uh, there were several people wearing masks. They had... Uh, the smoke uh, rating is uh, about as high as you could get as far as uh, you know having uh, so much smoke where you couldn't breathe. Yeah. How does that compare to Kentucky's wildfires? Well, believe it or not, uh, Kentucky actually has more numbers of fire than uh, a lot of states do, you know, even the western states. Uh, uh, we have a large number, but our average size fire is really small, and what, it's what we uh, call initial attack. that We go straight out. We have crews and our uh, equipment on standby during high fire times, and uh, we'll get out there very quickly and take care of the fire before it gets too big. Who is the we that helps put these fires out around the state? A lot of times a typical fire, and there can be a lot of variations, but there will be a fire called in to the local 911 center, 
if that's the case, uh, the 911 center will often call uh, the local volunteer fire department, and uh, they will get there first. And uh, typically, they will uh, do what they can with the fire, uh, you know, protect structures. A lot of times, they'll be able to spray them out if they're really small. If it gets to be uh, a little bit larger, uh, they'll either call us or we'll already be in route. And uh, uh, so it's uh, when I say we, the Kentucky Division of Forestry, and we have uh, full-time uh, ranger technicians. But we also have uh, uh, foresters that help. We have interim and emergency employees who we hire seasonally during fire season. And uh, we have bulldozers. Uh, we also contract aerial detection planes. So sometimes uh, we'll have to actually spot the fire ourselves from our aerial detection in our plane. And uh, we, we'll, uh, well, now we're using a lot of uh, GPS technology. Uh, we'll get actual coordinate latitude and longitude of the fire and send that in to our uh, regional offices. And then they'll dispatch a ranger, the county ranger, to the fire. Besides uh, even uh, the volunteer fire departments and the Kentucky Division of Forestry, we also uh, sometimes there'll be the local emergency management might come in and help. Uh, we have uh, Kentucky State Police. They've been a, a great help as far as uh, law enforcement investigation along with fish and wildlife. When I was a little boy, I lived across the street from the fire department in Carrollton, Kentucky. I would love to hear that whistle blow and see this huge red fire truck just come bursting out of the bay and then down the street to where, where it was going. Is that the same picture that I should have if I'm thinking about fighting a forest fire? Is it the same type of equipment and men and coats and hats? To specifically fight a wildland fire, uh, oftentimes, uh, the, especially the clothing or the protective equipment is different. The equipment that you saw and uh, when you were younger is a, what they refer to as bunker gear, which is a, a heavy, thick equipment for uh, firefighters to go indoors, you know, to fight structure fires. Uh, if we had that same equipment, uh, oftentimes on a wildland fire, we might have to walk miles, you know, during the course of putting that fire out, and mm. it just wouldn't be uh, conducive to wear all those clothes that thick. Uh, and you know it just it wear you out. So uh, what we have is a uh, Nomex, which is a fire resistant material. That's uh, our clothing, and it's uh, thinner, and uh, you know so we, and you can be more mobile and not uh, you know dehydrate. Uh, we also wear a hard hat. Everything's approved, uh, you know, through a, a national system. Uh, you know, safety, we have our eye goggles, uh, hearing protection if we need to, uh, at least an 8 to 10 inch leather boot with Vibram sole. I'm guessing that a fire truck is so big because it's carrying a lot of water. Am I right? Yeah, that's correct. I've never given that a moment's thought until now. Why do the things have to be so big? I know they have a lot of hoses, there are ladders, there are firemen, maybe firewomen on the back of them, but they do carry a lot of water. Do you have that luxury in the field? How do you get water into the field to put out a wildfire? Well, water is a very uh, valuable tool. You know, it cools the fire and it cuts the oxygen out. Uh, to uh, help extinguish the fire. But like you just said, uh, a lot of times our fires are in remote areas where uh, there's no way we can tank a 1,000-gallon tank uh, tanker in there. Uh, so oftentimes the way we fight fires is to cut the fuel off, and oftentimes that is digging a, uh, uh, a line, we call it, which is a fuel break. Uh, now, oftentimes we use bulldozers to do that, which would be cut a, say, a 6-foot or a six to twelve foot path down to bare mineral soil, which is our fire break, all the way around the fire. You know, it's just like any chain; it's only as good as its weakest link. So the fire, the line has to be continuous. And sometimes we dig it by hand with uh, fire council rakes, or uh, we use leaf blowers, uh, backpack leaf blowers. Uh, they're very effective in certain situations. And then when that's what we call a hand line. And a lot of times on a fire, you'll have a place where a dozer can go, and then you'll have uh, uh, other sections where you can only do hand lines, say over steep bluffs and that type of thing. And then what that does is we cut the fuel to that fire off, and then we'll go in and do what we call isolation, which is to take 
all the old dead snags and, and, and jackpots of fuel, which is like big brush piles that's near our line, and we'll actually isolate around them and clear a line around those. And then we do what we call a, a, a backfire or a line fire, and that's to burn from our line back to the main fire. And what that does is that controls everything. We can make sure when we leave that that fire's in good shape and there's nothing burning real hot next to our line. Kentucky wildfire is the topic. More with Chief Floyd Willis with the Kentucky Division of Forestry after the break. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. Back on Kentucky Field Radio, my name is Charlie Baglin. Fall fire hazard season is the topic. Floyd Willis with the Kentucky Division of Forestry is my guest. Mr. Willis is the fire chief, and most folks think to put out a fire, you simply pour water on it. How's it work in the real world? Yeah, we have to uh, manage the way that we suppress the fire, for sure. I mean, it's a definitely a technique. Uh, you know, most people, when you see a, f- a f- wildfire or forest fire, you know, it gets you really excited. And, and a lot of people run around, they try to go straight to the flames, you know, knock the flames out directly. And oftentimes it's best to do what we call an indirect attack here, and that's to back off, cut a good line, isolate all the snags, and then uh, burn it out. And that seems to be really the most effective tool that we use. I know in times when we have these major fires out west, and it seems like the firefighters are going to concede that, okay, we can't put it out instantly right now, that if we can block it up to a point, maybe protect life, protect property, protect the subdivision. You're exactly right. In a lot of western states, uh, they've come to realize that fire out there, a lot it is kind of part of the ecosystem over time. And what's happened is that uh, humans have moved into directly into that ecosystem. And those fires are often caused by lightning. There's a small percentage that are caused by arson. And they also have vast areas of land. Uh, so when they get a fire started, uh, there's a point there where there's just not going to be enough resources to actually corral that fire in and completely put it out. And they're pretty sure they know in a certain amount of time there'll be rain that will come, hopefully. And so they, they have actually uh, gone to that in certain situations where they'll manage a the fire. They protect the life and structures first, and then they'll actually let it burn. Here in Kentucky, uh, it's still uh, pretty well... Uh, we go directly to that fire, and we will completely uh, control that fire when we leave. That's that's our number one goal. And the reason being is uh, really here in Kentucky, we don't have those vast. I mean, you know, we think we have large areas, but compared to out west or Alaska, we don't really have vast areas that aren't going to be affected people's uh, st- structures or their livelihoods. And that's really our number one goal is, you know, to protect life and then secondly to uh protect uh, property and another thing is uh, our hardwoods are extremely valuable uh, you know oak hickory that type of thing yeah. and and an uncontrolled wildfire uh, racing up a hill can cause extreme ecological and especially uh, economical damage to those to somebody's timber you know if you have a, a real nice stand of uh near white oak for example and the fire races up a hill it's going to damage the uphill side of that tree and it'll cause eventually it'll cause it to be hollow even though that tree didn't catch on fire immediately the damage has been done and then by that tree being hollow at the base it uh, basically you know uh, really reduces the value of that tree so that's one thing that uh, one reason we try to go in and you know go ahead and keep the fire small and get them taken care of quickly and people don't want their house going up in smoke, and birds don't either. Squirrels don't either. Neither do deer, elk, you name it. Yeah. Uh, wildlife out there, when the woodlands burn, often so does where they live. Now a bird can get up and fly to the next, it can fly across the hillside. But fawn deer have a little tougher time of that. Fall, you always have a fire hazard season. What do you call that? It starts October 1st. Basically, over time, it's been determined that uh, from October 1st to December 15th in the fall, and then from uh, February 15th to April 30th in the spring, are the times during the year in Kentucky that are most likely to have for us to have a wildfire. 
But that is the time of year that the leaves are off the trees. But in the fall, with the leaves off, the sun has direct penetration to the forest floor, and it dries the leaves, and uh, it, it, it makes it more uh, suitable to burn. During the yeah, day. you're right. Yeah. You're right. Didn't give that any thought. You're going to have a lot of people in the woodlands in fall. Could be they're just there to hike, camp, take pictures of the fall colors. They may be there doing some archery hunting or deer. They're out in the woods. You're a sportsman yourself. You like to hunt and fish. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do the presence of people, regardless of why they're there, does that worry you? Does that worry the fire crew that, oh, no, if we have uh, somebody build a campfire? Is that problematic? What goes through your head come fall with all the people there are in the woods? Just some stats for you, you know, uh, 99% of the fires that are we have in Kentucky are human-caused. 99%? Yeah, and so uh, there's 1% uh, caused by lightning. And uh, in my, you know, uh, close to 20 years, I've only known one or two, maybe three uh, fires that I am fairly sure uh, were started by lightning, and everything else is human-caused. So. so of the 99%, what of those are just accidental or or arson? Well, uh, it usually goes right around 60%, 61% of all the fires we have in Kentucky are arson. So, so deliberately set. Yeah, deliberately set. So it's a, it's a huge number, a huge percentage of the fires we have are arson. Can you catch an arsonist? This would be a good time to segue into the new program I understand you all have been doing. With bloodhounds, it's an arson dog program, and uh, we use. Uh, uh, you know, my uh, predecessor uh, started a program. It's it's a very good program to uh, initiate and to work on uh, our arson problem. Basically, we use uh, bloodhounds that are used in the correction system, the prison system. Those dogs have been trained and. Uh, really just kind of unbelievable what they can do is go out to a fire that's occurred and actually track that scent from the origin of that fire back to you know where where it went to and uh, we've actually had some cases already you know where it tracked the person back to their home they're an amazing uh, uh, creature really that's able to do that type of thing that is something that, uh, that you can pick a person's scent i guess it's probably Skin cells, maybe, that are sh sloughed off. How do you spell slough? Anyway, they have sloughed off. That's and the bloodhound can pick that up Yeah, and uh, follow them over miles. Yeah, th there were some examples I've heard of, you know, where uh, driving down a highway, you know, with the windows up, and they're able to track, track it. It's just amazing. It's almost uh, science fiction worthy. Yeah. So you've had this program going on with the bloodhounds for a year. Does it seem cost effective? Are you happy with the results? Overall, the uh, statistics are uh, uh, pretty dramatic. What it does is uh, helps us with uh, letting people know that you know the word gets around that we're using these dogs, and it helps to curb arson if somebody is you know thinking that they have a real good chance of getting caught. You know, it kind of makes a difference. And then also, uh, as we go along, we're going to get better at it. You know, we're going to. I try to beef up the program. So, uh, how many dogs are on the force? Uh, right now, uh, two on the force, and like I said, we uh, work with the uh, corrections and the state police, uh, and those are the two that are used mainly right now. So, so what type of conviction rate or success rate are you having chasing down arsonists? Exact numbers I, I don't have at this time, but uh, like I said, it's been a very successful program, and like I said, it's at the beginning stages. So. Well, let's say I'm in Rowan County, and I set a match to the Daniel Boone National Forest, and I get in my car, and I drive back to my house 100 miles away. That dog could potentially find me, you're thinking. If uh, they get there quick enough, uh, I think really the sky's the limit if they get there quick enough and can identify the scent. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, variables, of course, but I know that they, uh, in, during the, one of the trainings, they'll actually track somebody in a, in a vehicle. So it's the same, you know, as they use to track, uh, 
you know, if somebody uh, would escape prison, you know, yeah. type of deal. So. Well, I'm going to guess that an arson may not just limit himself or herself to one fire. They may love this activity of theirs. They may go and start, I don't know, half a dozen fires. I'm just guessing. Any, any evidence of that? Yeah, I think that's a very good guess. The reason being is that a lot of times we'll have fires in the same location, the same time, you know, just about in the same year. So it shows a definite pattern. And uh, so it, it leads to believe that it's uh, a lot of times it could be one person, you know, uh, causing a lot of, of our fires. And, you know, it's pretty easy to, to start a fire, really. You know, I mean, you can, uh, you know, find a cigarette lighter or matches just about anywhere. And, you know, uh, you know, you can get one person that can cause a whole lot of damage for sure. We brought up the subject a little while ago about all the people in the woods in the fall, from deer hunters to fly fishermen, hikers, fall color enthusiasts, backpackers, kayakers. Would that be a concern given the amount of human-caused fires there are? It sounds to me like the actual reverse could be true, that these people are your eyes and ears in the woods. We'll explore that aspect of things. Time for a break. We must get to our fishing report and then back with more on Kentucky's fall fire hazard season. My name is Charlie Baglin, and you're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. Baglin back on Kentucky Afield Radio, and let me invite you to like us on Facebook. You can find us in the search box, just put... Kentucky Afield Radio, and you'll find the weekly link if you want to share it on Facebook or email it to a buddy. You can also find us on YouTube. Just put Kentucky Afield Radio in the search box. Where else? MyHuntingAndFishing.com has the show. Also, iTunes, we are a weekly podcast, so plenty of choices. Back with more on the fall fire hazard season. First up, our fishing report. This is Tom with your fishing report from the Northeast. Up on Cave Run Lake, the drawdown to winter pool has begun and temps are running in the 70s. Bass are slow with the lake being drawn down and the fish are holding a little bit deeper. Find the depth the fish are holding at and crank those depths. Fish around structure and brush piles. Crappie have similarly slowed back a little bit. Brush pile jumping is still working on the main lake but has slowed down and most fish have shifted up the river so that's where folks have been fishing at the most. Uh, Muskie have also tapered back a little bit with the drawdown. Grace and Lake Bass are starting to pick up. Anglers are catching them early on top water and on crankbaits later in the day. The hybrid bite is picking up on Grayson as well. Anglers are fishing crankbaits, trolling over the old river channels and picking up a few. If you can find the schools of them, you'll have a blast up there. And that should do it for us this week. Wherever you go, good luck and stay safe. This is Rob Rold in the Northwestern Fishery District. At Rough and No End, crappie have become more active. Spider rigging at uh, around 10 to 12 foot depth along the channel banks or fishing jigs and minnows 8 to 10 feet deep around blowdowns and brush piles along those banks. Largemouth bass fishing picked up as well by fishing buzz baits, spinner baits, as well as medium running crawdad colored crank baits. And those are especially efficient along some of the deeper rocky banks. White bass have been a little bit more active in the upper Nolan area, actually above Bacon Creek, which is the uppermost ramp on Nolan. And at Rough River Lake, we're starting to see some better hybrid striped bass fishing, also in the upper end of that lake. Please remember, always be safe on the water and wear your life jacket. This is Jeff Crosby with the Central District Fishing Report. The largemouth bass are moving into fall patterns. Many of these bass can be found in creek arms, chasing shad, crate baits, rattle traps, or red-eye shad are popular baits when fished around shoreline cover. Additionally, at Taylorsville, catches of crappie have been increasing. Standing timber or brush piles adjacent to deep water in 6 to 12 foot of water are very productive. Live minnows and crappie jigs have been the best bait for catching these crappie. Also this time of year, fishermen are experiencing good success at many of our small lakes such as Beaver, Bolt, Selmer, and McNeely Lakes catching bluegill and shellcracker. So grab a pole with a line and enjoy some great fishing. Hope to see you on the water. 
We are playing with fire as the show continues after the break. Hip's a hip word. Hip hop music. This cat is really hip, says 70s star Sammy Davis Jr. But for migratory bird hunters, hip is the law. HIP stands for Harvest Information Program. To hunt birds like doves or geese, you must complete the HIP survey first to help officials better estimate game bird populations. Go to the My Profile page at the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website. You just need five minutes. HIP HIP hooray. FW.KY.gov. I sail home on peaceful waters. Kentucky has some troubled waters. Sailing in a sewer all the way. Boaters dumping waste overboard when no one's looking ruins the day for everyone, fish included. So use an approved dump station. Sailing in a sewer all the day. Dilution is not the solution. Use your holding tank wisely or hold it in. A message from your Kentucky wildlife and boating officers. We are back in our second half hour on Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, and there's a TV show my wife and I like to watch. It's called Person of Interest. The show opens with this guy saying, You are being watched. The government has Have you ever had that feeling? System. You're being watched? Spies on you. I know How do you feel when you drive down the street? You look up, you see a sign that says, Neighborhood Watch. Even if you're being good, you're still under surveillance. We see cameras everywhere. Go to the store, post office. Go to somebody's front porch. Camera. What about in the woods? What about motion-activated cameras, monitoring deer, wildlife, trespassing? If your number's up. What about somebody out flying an aerial drone? What about hunters, backpackers, bird watchers? Every one has a pair of binoculars. What do you think? Is your number up? It's enough to make me think twice if I were an arson. Floyd Willis, fire chief with the Kentucky Division of Forestry. These people can be of service to you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the average sportsman, if they're out in the woods and they see suspicious activity, uh, by all means, you know, get a hold of, you can call Target Arson, call your local 911 center, Yeah. Uh, call the Kentucky Division of Forestry, let us know what you've seen, and uh, we might be able to catch some of these folks that are doing that, setting our woods on fire. Suspicious activity. That wouldn't be building a campfire. Or would it? I don't know. What What is suspicious activity? You've seen it. You know, obviously, uh, if you see somebody in the area they're not supposed to be, and uh, they come in the area and then immediately leave, and the next thing you know, you know, you've got a fire going on. Or uh, even better yet, if you actually see them light the fire, of course, you know, that would be even, even better. You know, uh, now campfires, uh, that's not an intentional arson set. Now, campfires can cause force fires obviously but an arsonist is somebody who's intentionally setting the woods on fire the other person will be to be a campfire and then there's people that burn brush that cause a debris fire we call it you know they're burning debris now uh, those people uh, need to understand you know our, our laws and take precautions you know if you're in doubt you can call your local forestry division of forestry office and uh, Find out if it's a good day to burn or all the different burn laws, you know, uh, and make sure you're in compliance. That way you can avoid, you know, that problem. But the arsonists, like I said, they go out with the intent to uh, set the woods on fire. So six of ten are arson-related. You have so then four out of ten that are caused but not intentionally. Mm -hmm. What would cause those? And those might seem to be the easiest ones to control. Hey, do you know you were doing this? Maybe you shouldn't. Oftentimes with debris burns, which would be the next uh, largest cause, uh, if you're doing a debris burn, uh, a lot of times people will uh, they'll clean the brush out from an area on their property and they'll put it in a pile. In the fall, they'll get all their leaves together and maybe throw some limbs on it next to their house. Mm -hmm. Well, those are the ones they'll, they'll uh, light that on fire to remove that debris and uh, they'll be too close to a woodland or a day that's real windy. And oftentimes that's where it'll escape. And those uh, situations can be uh, avoidable. Uh, one, it's uh, it's easy or best to be at least 150 feet from a woodland. 
or anything that can cause the fire uh, to spread into a woodland uh, when you burn. And that's been determined to be a pretty safe distance to keep the fire from igniting the local woodland. Another thing you can do is wait till outside our fire season. That will help out a whole lot too because that's usually times that it's less likely for fires to to spread in the woodland. And then thirdly, you know, we're always available. Uh, give us a call here to Division of Forestry and we'll be happy to let you know if it's a good time to burn and help you out with that. So we're talking October 1 through middle of December. Burning of forest, grass, crops, woodlands, marshes, or other similar areas. Burning of leaves, debris, campfires, bonfires, open pit cooking, and charcoal grilling. Wouldn't have thought about charcoal grilling. And the use of fireworks, of course. Always wondered about that. You shoot off a bottle rocket, lands in the woods, next thing you know. I will make a distinction. Uh, there is a difference between our uh, forest fire hazard season and a burn ban. The county judge executives will enact a burn ban in, in their particular county, and that is uh, we'll get into what you were just talking about, about as far as like, uh, fireworks and open burning, uh, campfires, that type of thing. The, okay. our, our actual forest fire hazard seasons, those seasons, which was October 1st to December 15th and then February 15th to April 30th, it's illegal to burn anything within 150 feet of any woodland or brushland between the hours of 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., and that's basically the daylight hours during that time. And that, those are the times that it's more likely a fire to escape. Now, an actual burn ban, what causes those is, will be usually it's a time of drought, and there's already been numerous forest fires in that particular county. And at that point, the judge executive will uh, initiate a burn ban. And then there's also burn bans uh, that can be initiated separately by the, like I say, the Daniel Boone National Forest. They can initiate a burn ban on the whole forest. And uh, I've actually seen that happen. So those are the distinctions between those two. Uh, forest fire hazard season, and then there's an actual county burn ban. Now, the fire hazard season always happens every year. And you might go several years in between county burn bans. Now, there are some counties that actually have a open burning ban on their own, but that's other reasons probably than forest fires, air quality, and that type of thing. So fires, of course, are going to be determined by how dry or maybe how lush or wet the landscape is. In a year where we have a ton of rain, I imagine you're going to have fewer fires. Drought, you're going to have more. Right. The thing about weather, especially in Kentucky, is it changes very quickly. You know, we can have a very wet summer, and uh, actually, what that can do is that uh, can cause a flush of uh, vegetation, uh, which is eventually going to be fuel. So, if we end up having a real dry, say August, September, we could actually go into October and be in the fires then. Really? Uh, and uh, I've seen it where we've had rain one day. Uh, or even snow, we actually did that this last spring where uh, one uh, the north-facing side of the hill of the hollow had snow on it, and we had fire on the south-facing side. Uh, it dried, you know, the, where the sun hits and dried it that quickly. And we've actually tied fire into snow banks before. So the, it really depends on the daily, especially, you know, weekly to daily weather. But... If you go into an area, uh, you know, in the fall and it's rain and the ground's good and wet, that's going to help you out a whole lot. But you can still have fires really quickly. Uh, it just takes a few days of real low humidity and sunshine and especially the wind. Uh, the wind is the key, you know, one of the key factors. For yeah, just like if you were blowing on a campfire to try to get it hot, you imagine a whole rush of wind exactly. coming in and blowing on a forest. It's just really going to set it ablaze. Yeah, yeah it really puts the oxygen there, and, uh, and you know, it really uh, fuels uh, and causes rapid spread. I have a note here that fire causes eight and a half billion, that's billion with a B, dollars of impact to tourism. Do I have that correct? People come to see our forest and... I, you, they don't want to see charred trees. They want to see beautiful. And they just stay on the economic impacts, and on average, it costs the landowners uh, $404 per acre in the timber damage 
to their property and and that's a that's an average it can be much higher than that that's not a small amount you know if you own 100 acres of forest you know it, it adds up pretty quickly you say we have more fires here than we do in the arid west but they burn smaller acreages what are those numbers do they go up and down each year they're about the same well uh you know a lot of times we'll uh we have a small percentage of our fires that go over 100 acres a uh, very small percentage and that's like nothing compared to fires say in new mexico yeah you know they they're they'll reach tens of hundreds of thousands of acres so uh yeah it's it's very rare for us to have a fire over 100 and you know it's just a rare event for us do we have many injuries or deaths due to wildfires in this state there's been some fatalities uh over the years and uh that's the thing about a wildfire the acres is a number to keep in mind but uh the danger uh is not really counted by acreage so uh even though uh you know we have a large number of smaller fires the reason we do is because of our uh, uh efforts in training and uh, the efforts of our people our employees with the Division of Forestry and also with the uh, Volunteer Fire Department and all the agencies that assist, uh, the effort that we put forth to get to those fires quickly and put them out. You know, going back to uh, the fatalities, you know, there's uh, there's been three fatalities in Kentucky that I'm uh, personally familiar with, and that, that's really, you know, one of my, if not my most uh, uh, driving force is to try to keep our uh, firefighters safe. You've had three 1999, there was uh, two volunteer fire department members in Brown County that uh, passed away on a forest fire. And then uh, the Kentucky Division of Forestry had uh, an employee that passed away. had a statistic. We've had eight deaths in the last 15 years or 16. And three of those were firefighters. Yeah. Nowhere really in the east is known for wildfires, except... For Florida. Yeah, Florida, generally when their fire season kind of runs is during the summer. It's all about their uh, the way that their the swamps will dry out and, and you know when they get their rains and that type of thing. We are talking about the fall forest fire hazard season in Kentucky. Back with more with our final few with the fire chief, Floyd Willis. And you're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. Back on Kentucky Field Radio, and my name is Charlie Baglin. Back with our final few minutes on the subject of Kentucky forest fires. Smokey Bear says, don't do it and you gotta mind smoking. Being found guilty of arson doesn't look good on your resume, or your job application, or your bank account, or on your planning calendar, if you have anything to do over the next few years, maybe. Chief Willis with the Kentucky Division of Forestry, what is the penalty? Well, the fine is uh, not less than a thousand dollar fine. So uh, you'll can it go up from there? It can go up from there. Not more than a five year prison sentence if you are convicted of arson. Or it could be both. You could be fined like a thousand dollars or five thousand, or it seems like it maxes out at some point. Or you could actually get that and your five years. Absolutely. There could even be civil penalties, you know, for uh, damage to property and that type of thing. The cause for alarm for fires back oh, in the early days, I don't know what day that would have been, but we're going back 100 years. The Whenever fire protection laws were actually enacted, been like $20 fine. $20 fine wasn't much. Yeah, it wasn't much, but uh, like you said, though, it's it's probably uh, a few hundred dollars at least in today's terms. So. Well, I think lawmakers are certainly taking note the, of the seriousness absolutely, of wildfires. There's one thing about you and your crew, and I've had a, a relationship with the Kentucky Division of Forestry now for, I don't know, 25 years, that I have heard that when there is a major fire, say out west or in Alaska where you were earlier, you can actually send help from Kentucky there to help them battle these blazes. Is that still going on? True. Uh, We work uh, with uh, the Daniel Boone National Forest uh, here, and uh, they actually will uh, 
we work in cooperation with them, and they'll actually dispatch us out to uh, fires in mm-hmm. in the uh, western United States or Alaska. Uh, we've also traveled to the southeast, uh, Florida, you know, Georgia, North Carolina, uh, so on and so on, even to Minnesota we've, and Texas. Uh, and uh, what we do is uh, uh, oftentimes the employees will take, uh, if we go on Western Fire Detail, we'll take uh, leave here. It's a voluntary. So you're not there on state time? Not on state time. Uh, we're representing the state. You know, we call ourselves the Kentucky uh you know, state crew, and uh, so we go out there and uh, and uh, work uh, for the Forest Service at that time. The U.S. Forest Service. Yes. And then if we go southern, uh, what we call Southern Compact, uh, we go down, uh, say, to Florida. Then we go, uh, a lot of times in, in those situations, not always, but we'll end up taking our pumper trucks that we use for fires here and uh, we'll take and, and work those areas and assist those states out. Let's say you were going to go to Oregon or Washington, and God love you for wanting to go out there and help, but that's not cheap just getting yourself there, especially if you have to go. Do you have to go on your own nickel? You're not paid while you're there, but are you? Uh, is there any assistance, uh, maybe even federally, to, to, to get your, your guys there? Is I, there food? Is there a place for them to sleep? Well, actually, uh, we are hired uh, uh, through the... U.S. Forest Service, so we were actually working for them, and they they actually provide, you know, it's it's almost that it would be similar to, uh, you know, it's not, but it's it's similar in the same pattern of a military type of an organization where, you know, they they provide our transportation and food. Uh, oftentimes we'll sleep, you know, we we'll sleep in tents and when we're out there on the operational period, but it'd be uh, similar to that type of a, it's organized very similar. Uh, we follow what we call the incident command system, and uh, so uh, everybody knows who their supervisor is. And uh, uh, you know, we're fed. Uh, sometimes they'll have uh, food that's catered for us. You know, that will be out there on in the camp. Uh, sometimes we eat uh, MREs, which are military issued uh, food. So uh, it's no vacation, is it? Uh, no, I mean it, it's uh, very enjoyable. Uh, you know, we get into some. Uh, uh, very interesting areas that we would normally wouldn't get to see, but uh, you know we're out there to work. That's what we're there for. But you see them, you know, when they're at their worst. You know, we have to. We'll travel in. Uh, you know, we fly in helicopters. You know, so we get to see a lot of area, not just where the fire is, but you know, and then we get to see what we're protecting when we're there. It has to make you feel good because you're there with people from all over the east. Or from all over us in the United States. Absolutely. To help put this out. This, the term called hot shots, am I right with that? Yes. Is that something that's official, or do you all appreciate that name, being called a hot shot? Well, uh, the hot shots are a uh, tier of a uh, crew. Uh, you know, uh, they have a, uh, a different hierarchy. That there's a, The first in the line is what they call smoke jumpers. And those are the guys you've seen that they actually parachute out of planes into remote areas to to fight fire. And then the smoke jumpers are there. And then the next step would be the hot shots. And they're what they, talk, they call a class type one crew. And they're uh, the upper echelon. And they actually work full time during the year together. You know, they're a, a one group. And you'll have different agencies, different areas, U.S. Forest Service. Uh, Bureau of Land Management, um, Fish and Wildlife, they actually sponsor these hotshot crews. And uh, they're one of the first, uh, you know, you have smoke jumpers, and smoke jumpers don't go on all fires, but most of the bigger fires you see out west and even here in the east, the hotshots are the ones that will go in uh, usually first. And then you have uh, what we call Type 2 crews. Uh, there's uh, one called Type 2 Initial Attack, and that's what our Kentucky crew was. What's the easiest way to get in touch with you for arson or just for out of curiosity? 1-800-TARGET-ARSON. If it's a fire that's ongoing, it might be best to call your local 911 center or then the Division of Forestry. Well, Chief, I have one last question. Do you text and drive? Uh, No, sir. Fire Chief Floyd Willis with the Kentucky Division of Forestry. And, sir, I appreciate you being on. Those forest fire hazard season dates again. 
October 1st through December 15th. No burning between 6A and 6P within 150 feet of a woodland or a brushland. If you are in the woods, watch for suspicious activity. 1-800-TARGET-ARSON or 911 would appreciate the tip. We are out of time. My name is Charlie Baglin, inviting you to join us in a week. And we will go inside outdoors again, right here on Kentucky Afield Radio. Thank you.